today we're going to talk about keys and um, understanding how what the roles they play in the database, uh, how to define entities and their relationships, and what steps you'd use to um, determine such items. So as a reminder from last week, a database system organizes data into tables of rows and columns, just like as if you looked at a spreadsheet, Excel, numbers. Those of us past a certain age, Lotus 1, 2, 3. Um, and the columns represent categories of data. The rows basically collect the instances of those categories. And um, databases are basically structured to store data and the data should have relationships. So that's fairly straightforward there. So there are a few different uh, naming conventions that will be used. Um, often when you see my examples, they're gonna be lowercase with um, underscores as separators between words. That's known as snake case. Um, your lab profs may enforce a different one. So double check with your lab prof what they expect to see in their naming conventions. Um, because I, I tend to bring it up at this point, whether I have the labs or not, uh, because unlike Java, which has very defined code conventions and PHP has coding conventions and Python has coding conventions, uh, database naming conventions tends to still be kind of a holy war. Uh, you will have people downright get insulting with each other over how things should be called in a database. Why? I don't know. Um, considering there's basically a de facto standard, but it's because it's not in written official, thou shalt do it this way, uh, people will still do whatever they want. So you may have an employer that follows one convention, then you find a new job and they'll use practically the opposite. Uh, the most important thing to take away from this slide is um, be prepared to be flexible with your naming conventions. Uh, usually most organizations have a naming convention that they use. It is what it is. Okay, so now that I got that out of the way, um, there are, in the work of database, it's one of the few pieces of the IT industry, the same thing can have multiple names. And they are all equivalent to each other. So you'll have a single person use one word, then somebody else will come around and use another word, but it means the exact same thing. So the common ones you'll see is table, column, and row. And so that's you know the most common ones, but you'll also hear relation, attribute, and tuple. Um, and the last one is file, field, and record. Now, file, field, and record dates back a long time. We're going back to the days of 4GLs. Um, for those of you that don't know what 4GLs are, uh, COBOL is an example of a 4GL. Data was stored as files on a disk. The applications would read the files and operate against them. There were fields and records. So the most common substitution you'll see in this table is column and field. They will switch back and forth between each other, uh, regardless of, you know, you'll even see me use both at the same time because I've had to use both in my career. So my brain says field, column, it's the same thing. Um, row and record are also pretty much synonymous. Um, row, if people were old school database developers, record were if you started out a Windows developer. Normally, it's where you start seeing that substitution. Um, a tuple is the pocket protector version. Um, you don't tend to see a lot of people use the phrase tuple in the wild unless they're data scientists or they're in university. Uh, tuple is basically the exact same thing as a row as a record. It's just not commonly used. Now, the blue row is specifically more with the conceptual side of the deal. So the top one and the bottom one have to do more of the physical side. The blue row is more conceptual. So for today, I'll tend to be using the words well, relation and attribute. 
we won't be talking about rows at all. Uh, more than anything else. And I may use the word entity, which is the same thing as a relation. Okay, so just as a quick flashback, this is, you know, if you were looking at access, um, you'd have a student table. There's an entire row, so that's the collection going across. The going downwards is the columns, uh, also known as fields or attributes. Um, so relational databases store data about entities in something called a relation. Um, a relation is just another word for a table. It's not the same thing as a relationship. So this is where some people get confused when talking about database terms, is you'll have something called a relation, and then somebody will say relationship, they're not the same thing. One has more letters. Therefore, it serves a different purpose. So relationship is the connection between one or things. A relation is one of the things that is related to something else. I don't know why they couldn't at least try to be a little more uh, distinct with their choices of words, but that's the cho words they choose. So a relation is a two-dimensional object or a table. That's certain characteristics. Uh, rows contain data about an entity. So essentially, like I think I was talking to you guys last week about students being an example of an entity, and each of you are an instance. An instance is also known as a row. Um, columns contain data about the attributes of the entities. Um, all entries in a given column are the same kind of same kind of data. Uh, that's known as a domain. Actually, there's slides about that coming up. Uh, but essentially, if you have a column called first name, it should contain people's first names. It's not going to contain their address or their date of birth. Um, each column has to have a unique name. Otherwise, the database server will not know what it is you're asking about. Um, each intersection of a row and a column contains a single value. Um, just like when you look at a spreadsheet, if I go back here, each intersection of a row and a column contains only one value, which is that point right here. Cells of a table hold a single value. Um, Order of the columns is not important. So you could literally have address, first name, date of birth, last name. Database server does not care. The order of the columns is not important as long as it's always the same data that goes into the same column. The order of the rows is not important. The database server, database server could not care less what order the data is in. It can take care of sorting it for you. And the last one's the important one. No two rows may be identical. Because if you have two identical rows, you cannot identify one or the other. That means you can't maybe delete the duplicate. You can't update one of the duplicates to not be a duplicate. You then have just duplicates. And the only choice you have at that point is to delete them both and recreate, which is terrible. Imagine you wanted to paint your bedroom a different color, so you had to knock down your house first to paint your bedroom. Yeah, exactly. So in other words, it's saying that the entire row as a whole must be unique going across. So from left to, well, in this case, left to right or whatever, right? The whole row has to be unique unto itself. Um, this is an example of a table or an employee relation. And you can see that it has columns, it has rows, it has unique volume, unique values per column and row. Um, and each row is unique. So that's basically what would be a relation. Um, now, these are not relations. Why are they not relations? Because they have multiple values per cell. If you look here, they've got multiple phone numbers for each person in a single cell. Because that's known as a uh, multi-valued attribute. 
And that's a big no-no because the database server doesn't know actually how to do that. Um, later this term, you'll learn how to deal with this situation when you see it in the wild. All right, so which leads me, now that we're done discussing basically what data looks like in the database, um, or innovation, I should say, uh, we're gonna talk about keys. Keys is one of the important concepts in database design. A key is a combination of one or more columns that allows you to uniquely identify a single row in a relation. Everybody in this room has a unique identifier of some sort. Most of us have multiple. You guys have a student number. You probably have some sort of uh, government issued ID, Canada SIN number, or you know a, 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 a an SSN in the U.S. Um, health card number, passport number, driver's license number. Those are all examples of unique identifiers that you may have one of or more. Well, actually, if you're a student, at least I know for a fact you have a student number, if nothing else. Um, that's a guarantee. So a key is used to identify a row. A composite key is a key that consists of more than one, or more than one column. So that means um, way back in the day, here at the college, I don't know if I, because I teach the most exact same material to two different classes. Did I tell you guys the story about the student number here at the college years ago? No. Okay. So way back in the day, when Algonquin first started out, they didn't used to give students student numbers. People were looked up using their SIN number. Your SIN number was your student number, which, you know, back in the 70s, it wasn't all that dangerous because identity theft was not as easy to accomplish as it is nowadays. Uh, and this system worked great. Peachy keen. Until one day they opened up the doors to international students. Not saying there's anything wrong with international students. I think actually three quarters of your, or at least two thirds of your international students. The thing is, is that one of the students' passport number was identical to a Canadian student's SIN number. They tried to put the passport number into the system. The system said, no, too bad, not happening. Student does not get to enroll. I don't know what happened actually in the end, but basically put the system was designed that their key didn't work. So they ended up adding another column to the system just to hold it over, which basically was a single letter, S, P, V, you know, SIN number, passport, visa number. And I guess you could, they could put whatever letter they wanted in that column, I didn't care. And they changed it so that the unique key was a combination of that letter plus the other number. So that way they could put in students that had the same identifying number. It was kind of cool. Uh, and that's an example of a composite key where they had to use multiple attributes to uniquely identify a single thing in the system. A candidate key is something that exists at the beginning of the database design process. It may not, it will not exist at the end. A candidate key during the design process is a key that may become an identifier, thus it's a candidate. And basically it serves the same purpose as a primary key. You could use it in theory to uniquely identify a row of data. Again, a candidate key could be a person's SID number, person's driver's license number, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are candidate keys. In other words, while you're looking at the data, you're trying to decide what will be an identifier. You look at the ones that may work and those are the candidates. A primary key, which leads me to the follow-up, is at the end of the design process, you've picked the candidate key and it becomes a primary key. In other words, it, it gets elected as the winner of the battle of the keys. There are potentially one or more keys when you start with the data. And at the end, you should only ever have one primary key. Now, the primary key may have multiple columns, but there will only ever be one primary key per 
entity or table in the database. The, like I just said, the key might be a single single key, composite key, and they're not mutually exclusive. It'll make more sense as we work through this. That's just right now we're doing an info dump. So if we have a few um, examples here. So in the students table, we have a student number. That's the unique key for that one. We have a class number. We have a unique key for that one. Now, the grades table has a problem because there is no keys. We don't know who the grade belongs to. It's a totally useless piece of information there because that table does not have everything it needs. It's not actually able to ever be used. It's pointless. It's just a bunch of numbers. Now, I discussed what a primary key is. The primary key identifies the entire row. You got student number one, two, three, four, and you got class number 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And those are the primary keys for these tables. Based on those numbers, you can uniquely find that entire row. It's fairly straightforward. Those, to be specific, is something known as a surrogate key. Um, a surrogate key is a key that is manufactured. It has no real world meaning. It is a value that is assigned by the database, not by the application, not by the person sitting at the keyboard, not by the import process. The database server, you say, I'm gonna add a new student. The database server says, next student number is five. Number five can never be used again. It gives out the number once and only once. It's like, you know, when you go get a number, you're standing in line at the uh, financial aid office and you press a button, you get a number, or at least that's how it was before. A little, you get a little piece of paper, comes out and you get a number, that's your turn. Nobody ever gets to have that number after you, at least not that day. Same thing with the passport office, you get a little ticket, you know, E26, the next person might get an F24, but nobody ever gets E26 second time that day. That's what a surrogate key does. It gives a unique value to the row that is generated by the database. It has no real world meaning. It has no real world purpose. Sometimes it does get used in the real world. Anybody here have an idea of an example of a surrogate key that affects all of you? Pardon? Yeah, kind of. Okay, Canadian SIN number is actually a magic number. It actually has some built-in logic. So it's not a complete surrogate key, but you all have a surrogate key tied to you here at the school. There's even an example on the screen. Student number. Literally every single time one of you gets put into the system by the Ontario College's sign-up process, they'll do the import and, you know, student gets this number, the next record will get the next student number. The student numbers are sequential. Um, sometimes I've had a student where their student number wasn't as long as everybody else as well. In this case, they had more zeros after the zero four at the beginning. They actually had more zeros before the rest of their digits because they were a returning student that attended like in the eighties. Their student number is really small. I've had actually cases where I had four students in the class with the same, with a student number literally going one, two, three, four, one after the other, even though one was from China, one was from India, and the other two were from Canada. But just what happens when they were put into the system, they came in one after another. Kind of cool. So you all have a surrogate key. You have a perfect example of a surrogate key. It's your student number. And realistically, what that student number is, the uh, I don't, I'm not sure what the 040 is at the beginning, but basically everything after the 040 is the surrogate key that basically uniquely identifies you. The 040, I have no idea what that's for. Okay, so each row in the table is identified by a primary key. Um, as I said earlier, it's a combination of one or more columns that makes the row unique. Um, what happens, the most important part of the primary key is that we use to compare and define relationships between individual records. So for example, an ex a perfect example for you guys would be, there's a student record with your student number. And then there's a list of courses that you take. 
there's going to be a relationship between your student record and the course's record, and it uses your student record and the course ID. Based on those two pieces, something gets put in another table that maps you to certain courses. It allows you to create relationships between uh, separate records. It also allows people to have uh, the same name. The or the same date of birth, potentially the same address. Just because you can have a case of the same name multiple times, we have to have a way to pull it up. And usually the student number is it. All right, so once the correct primary key is chosen, uh, database lookups will be fast and reliable. So in the second half of the term, you'll be learning about SQL. And doing lookups by primary key is significantly faster and more reliable. If I was looking for a student ID of one, two, three, I could go, give me the record where the ID is one, two, three. If I couldn't use that, I'd have to go, well, give me the student record where the email address is you know, bob at email.com or where first name is Mohammed, last name is Mohammed. And then I'll end up with, you know, 300 students. So I had to keep adding and adding and adding to my query to get, to reduce it. On the other hand, if we're looking for 0400001234, it's one record. So the searches are going to be efficient, reliable. Um, so when you're choosing your primary keys, um, you want to follow a few basic rules. Keep it short. Um, so by that, I mean, avoid really long pieces of data. So when you're looking at the data and you're doing part of the design process, you're going to look at the different pieces of data and which one's going to be faster looking somebody up by number. So we're looking up for person 54 versus, you know, daniel.goudreau at somemail.com. The law, the number will be found much faster than the long string, specifically because you know what computers are really, really good at? Numbers. Even letters are numbers as far as computers are concerned. However, the fact that it has to convert the letter to a number, every single letter and character has to be converted to a number before it can work with it, as opposed to looking for a number directly. And it doesn't have to decide whether the A it's looking at is an A from the Latin character set, an A from the Chinese character set, an A from, you know, the Japanese character set. Take your pick. Just because it looks like an A doesn't mean it's an A. It just looks like an A. And just because the A is, I don't know what character it is on the keyboard, um, like 120 or something, and that's a, the letter A in a big A character it might actually be character 235 so the, num the characters won't even match up numbers will always be numbers regardless of what language you're operating in which leads me to point number two preference for a number whenever possible use numbers i just finished explaining why <laughs> they're faster um keep it simple so avoid primary keys that use complex characters again as people at working computers, we've all gotten used to characters we see all the time. Period, colon, slash, the at symbol, um, pound symbol, also known as a hash, not a hashtag, just a hash. The character we're seeing, however, they're special characters, which means the database needs to convert it to something it knows to deal with. And it slows everything down. And the last rule is once you've created a primary key and you start assigning values, you cannot change it. Well, no, you can change it, but it's not going to be a good time for anybody. Um, so you make sure that you try to make the best possible choice at the beginning to avoid having to fix things later. Um, has anybody in here ever lived in a house where that was built recently and then the builders had to come back to fix something? I've never had that problem. My house is almost 100 years old. But 
all the problems were dealt with long, long time ago. But there's a neighborhood not on called Central Park. Uh, it's just off Merivale and Baseline. Um, some of the houses actually had to get new foundations put under them. Why? They were an inch too thin. Or, sorry, uh, about two centimeters too thin. For the so instead of pouring the foundation, they poured inches because they were trying to save money, and then some of the houses started to crumble. You don't want to change your primary key after it's done. Just more than you want to get the foundation out from under your house after the house is built. It's not a good time for anybody. A primary key does not allow duplicates or null values. You cannot have the same value twice in a primary key. Otherwise, it's not a primary key. But you cannot have a null value. Um, I know it's only week two. I'm pretty sure most of you have not learned about nulls yet. A null is the absence of value. An empty string is not a null. It's the absence of value. The box is defined, but the inside is, does not exist. That's what a null is. You cannot, the thing is, is database servers love nulls. They're designed to work with nulls. They have special functionality to allow nulls. A null in a database server means, I don't know. You're going to put in a record into the database and there's no, there's a value there, but maybe you don't know what a person's phone number is. Therefore you didn't know because you don't know. And a primary key can, when you define primary key, you can define it at the table or at the column level. There's a couple of different ways of defining them. Uh, you'll learn about that later in the term. Uh, but essentially each table has a primary key. It may be one or more columns. All right, surrogate keys, which I literally just finished describing about four and a half minutes ago. Um, a surrogate key is an artificial column. It value supplied automatically by the database. I, your student number is an example. Um, most systems hide the surrogate keys from their users. Your student number is an exception to the rule, not an example of the rule. Because the value is artificial, it really has no real real world meaning. That's why we normally hide it. Like one of the systems at my day job has, uh, last time I checked almost 450 tables in it. It's quite a large data system. And each row has a numeric column in it, a uh, surrogate key. And how often do I show this, the numbers to my end users? Almost never. There is a handful of users that use this system. I literally, I can count them on the fingers of one hand, whoever needs to know what the IDs are. And there are people that are actually doing some low level stuff that nobody else gets to do. Normally it's cleanup. Some examples of surrogate keys that do float up to the surface. Well, your student number is a good example. My employee number is another good example here at the school. I have an employee number. Um, order numbers. You place an order with an online store, it'll email you with a number. That's a surrogate key. They created the number, the database created the number and assigned it. Receipt numbers are another example of a surrogate key. Those are examples when you do see them in the real world. But even then, you see one number. You see order number 55. You don't see the fact that every item you ordered also has a unique identifier. Each item in the order also is tied to a product that has a unique identifier. You only get the one that helps you pick the one thing that is relevant. So, although you may see the values of sort of keys here and there as you go through your life, there are no things you rare commonly see. You don't see, you'll see a few, but you won't see all of them. I guess them will have, you know, many surrogate keys that you don't see for every one that you do see. So here's an example of a, a property. It's here's a, basically there's a relation called rental property and it doesn't have a surrogate key. So that's the first example up top, this one. 
I'm going to be trying to make them so I don't like, like make these people feel left out. Um, when you look at it here, I'll use this one for the example. So rental property, to be able to uniquely identify this rental property, we have to have street, city, the state problems, and the postal code. Uh, and then country and rental rate are add on. So every time we want to find a rental property, we'd have to feed in an entire address. Somebody says, well, that's kind of stupid. Why would we want to do that? So suddenly they added on a single column called property ID. So now we can find properties just by one column, a single number, and it maps out. Um, this solves two problems. It solves complicated database lookups, and it also solves the fact that sometimes streets change names. It doesn't happen very often. Um, I know about four years ago, the city of Ottawa renamed about uh, 12 streets, 13 streets. Um, because when the city was amalgamated, and we're going back quite a few years here, like early 90s when they amalgamated the city, we had duplicate street names. And it took them 20 years to get around to renaming the streets properly. Go figure. So anybody who lived on that street that had a rental property in this structure would have had to go through and f update all of their records so that the street name would change. In other words, on the other hand, if all they needed to do was change, you know, this field and not change the property ID, you're not changing the primary key, life is good, it's easier to deal with. So, I literally just described this. I guess they're not coming in. So in here, anything that's underlined as part of the primary key, that's all this slide is saying, is the underlined columns in the first one is the possibles for Canada key. Uh, in the end, you end up having to use them all, um, or at least most of them. And in the second one, once you threw in the property ID, it's a surrogate key. It's now numerically defined. The database takes care of it. It never changes. Life is good. All right, a composite key is a key that contains two or more columns that's used for a primary key. So going back to my example of way back in the day where we suddenly had the unique identifier for a student being duplicated because it just so happened to identically match somebody's passport number, and it was a complete fluke. Absolute random event that that one student had a passport number that was identical to somebody's SIN number. The odds of that happening at the same school when the student population back then was maybe 5,000 students, 8,000 students, compared to now where we're sitting at uh, 70,000 students per term. You know, the odds are significantly better now than they would have been back then. It was tiny, but they ended up having to create a second column and use a composite key. And ident basically an identifier made up of two columns so that they could continue business. And then, you know, about a year or two later, they just started generating student numbers. That was the temporary fix until they put in something to handle the student numbers instead. All right. So, so far, what I discussed, hang on. So, so far, the what I discussed was ways to look up a unique item in the database. So, you have a primary key, an identifier, it's your student number. The a foreign key is, and it's an attribute or a column on a relation, that whose value comes from a primary key from somewhere else. So going back to your student course example, you got there's courses, there's sections, there's students. Somewhere in there, there's an intersection of a student and a course section. In that intersection, there'll be probably two foreign keys, a student number and a section identifier. 
Uh, I'm not sure how the school does their identifiers for this, but a good example for you guys would be uh, 23W CST8215 310, because if I remember, you guys are section 310. That would be the identifier for the course section. Your student number would be the identifier for you. You put them together, you have a, a relationship between a student and a course, and that connection is known as a foreign key. If you have a column that is defined as a foreign key, its value must exist somewhere else. It cannot exist by itself. So if I say, I got my little box, right? Pretend my box is a field, it's a foreign key. I cannot put a value in this that doesn't exist somewhere else. I can't say, I'm putting a cell phone in here if I don't have a cell phone to put in it. The cell phone comes from somewhere else, which just happens to be sitting in my hand. But at that point, I was able to put it in there because it exists. It physically went from, you know, existing to in here. Um, so a foreign key, the value in a foreign key must exist somewhere in the database before you can use it. Just like I cannot assign a student to a course unless a student has a student number. It's impossible. It's not how it works. Um, a foreign key is a single or multiple columns. If the uh, primary key that it's being fed from is a composite key, all the members of that composite key must exist as a foreign key. Um, So the term foreign key specifically means that it's a key in this table whose value comes from a table that is foreign to itself. That example, that, that sentence makes absolutely no sense. Um, you know what? I noticed it last summer when I read this because this is my second time teaching with these slides. Um, I didn't create these slides. You know, all the courses have to use the same slides. So basically put, it's a foreign key because its value comes from outside itself. Therefore, it is foreign to itself. Does that make a little bit more sense? It's just a stupid term. Okay. The A cup of coffee is foreign until you put it in your body. Then it's part of you. No, that's not coffee. That's that's pissed through a boot. <laughs> He's just going to move it away from himself. Sorry, I just really don't like Tim Horn's coffee. <laughs> uh, as a person who used to be really addicted to it, you go back after years, it's not coffee. I don't know what it is, but it's not coffee. Absolutely, you can create two tiny little tables. Well, they're, they're giving us an example right here at the bottom, right? We have a department and an employee. And the employee is assigned to a department. The employee's department refers to the department name. So, for example, you cannot assign an employee to a department unless the department already exists. Does that make a bit more sense? Okay, how about this? You cannot participate in CSTD 215 unless you are a student at the school. Okay. Therefore, until you get assigned to this course, you are a foreign entity. Therefore, you, your value is foreign to this course until it is assigned to it. Well, right now, at this point in time, this is not a physical design. We're just saying that this student, this student, sorry, this employee has a department and it ties to there. There are two separate things, yes. Yes.
apartment. Yes, in this case. Yeah, it, it has to be the value in department must exist in the table department. For example, you cannot be assigned to the IT department unless there is already an IT department. I know it happens sometimes where companies hire people and there's not actually a department for them, but in the real world, like unless, unlike, unless it's a startup, there is always a department you get assigned to. On my day job, I'm technically part of the web development team. That's my department. When I was hired, that's what I was hired to do. Technically, it's a sub-department of engineering. But I get assigned to a department. Once we start doing design later, like the actual design of all the entities, it'll make a bit more sense. You'll see. This is right now is just a terminology dump, and it's really brutal. So here's an example with tables. So I think some you said make tables, right? Here's some tables. So we have a student, we have a class, and then I mean, a uh, class, yeah, sure, class. And then we have a grade. So now we have a student number, class number, and the grade. Remember way back, like 10 slides ago, we had this exact same thing, except this last one didn't have these columns. So the student number is the primary key for student. Class number is the primary key for class. What happens is we have another table here called grade. So we have the student number gets carried in. And the course number gets carried in. So we can see that uh, Sam Cook, student number one, took course number 10 and number 40. So he took chemistry 101 and accounting 101. And that's his grades in those classes. That's what a foreign key does. So the value of student number comes from something foreign to the grade table. That's why it's a foreign key, because the value in here is not defined by the grade, it's defined by the student. The value in the course number is defined by the course, not within itself. And that's why it's called foreign. I think next time I teach this class, I'm just gonna get rid of that slide. It causes more confusion than it helps solve. Okay, so, this is just another example of the same thing. Um, you got a student and a course and a relationship. It's the same idea. Uh, apparently this one comes from Stack Overflow. The, the person who put these slides together at least put attribution of some sort. Um, and I don't know why this is here again. That's literally that table we had before. Oh, we're just redoing the same thing again. Okay. so. Like I said, like 10, now, now 12 slides ago, we had this set up where we had no idea where the grade belonged to. But if we add the foreign keys, and then we below, we know what grade belongs to what course and what student. Therefore, if I want to report, so what grades this did uh, Grace Green get, I could look them up by looking for student number four. I could tell what grades Grace got. And, um, I'm going to skip this slide because it makes no sense right now. When I cover this stuff later, it'll make more sense. Okay. So how do you know when or to use or not use a key? And there's a data scientist. His name was, last name was Cod. C-O-D-D. -D. No, there's no two Ds on a fish. There's just one D for a fish. Um, and essentially, he was the creator of something called relational algebra. So he created, a, he created an entire field of math that had to do with how data relates to other data. And um, one of the old textbooks for this course we used to use actually had an entire chapter on relational algebra. It was the thickest chapter in the book. It was like that, of a book that thick. And it was a really good way to put yourself to sleep. However, well, I'm not kidding. It's, oh, I had to study it, study when I went through school. The second I saw that textbook and I saw that chapter, I'm like, no, not again, PTSD. Um, oops. So, however, the, all those chapters on that algebra comes down to this. The rows in a relation must be unique 
However, there is no requirement for designated primary key. So in theory, you could have a relation, also known as a table, that has that is completely unique for every single row of data without a primary key being designated. However, the second you say that every row must be unique, it implies that a primary key can and probably should be designated. Um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. In other words, just because you can choose to not create a primary key doesn't mean you shouldn't create said primary key. So in the real world, every database table will have a primary key. Why? Because computers like them. So when do we designate a primary key? That we need more information about because that's part of the design process, which finally leads us to the actual meat of potatoes of today. Up till now was just descriptions of how to identify things. Now we're going to get to something that's actually going to start making a bit more sense for you guys. Okay. Entities. Entities is something that can be readily identified that somebody wants to track. An entity class is a collection of entities of a given type. An entity instance is the occurrence of a particular entity. So the word entity class, I've heard it used as entity class, entity type, and entity. They're all the same thing. So I'm going to avoid saying extra words. I'm just going to call them entities. Good enough, right? So an entity is a piece of information that we want to track. It is a thing. A thing such as a student, a course, could be the weather, uh, show times for a movie, um, your rankings in League of Legends. Those are all things a person may want to track. Those are entities. An instance is an occurrence of a particular entity. So if I go back to saying, okay, students are entities. So I have an entity called student. Each of you are an instance of said entity. So I'm going to say, I've got an, a thing called student. Each of you are an example of said thing. Congratulations, we're all things. Yes. Uh, technically, yes. Are you going to make things confusing? Yes. The database server itself, once you get down to the point where it's physical, it's not going to care. It really doesn't care. As long as you don't have the two things called entity at the same time, it's all good. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Well, it's a, yeah, it's an entity. So the table is an entity is a relation. They're all the same thing at different stages in its existence. So an entity becomes a relation, a relation becomes a table. So right now we're talking about entities because we're beginning, in the beginning, we need to create the definition of things. Thus, the definition is known as an entity. And normally, when you have an entity, there are many instances of that entity. Normally, you will not take the time to design an entity that only ever has one instance in it. What's the point of, imagine you're going to go, I'm going to create a room and only ever one instance of something can ever exist in this room. Only once. I'm going to put a ping pong ball in the middle of this room, and that is all that's ever allowed to be in there. Not a different ping pong ball, that ping pong ball. That's pointless. Why would you do that? Except as an art piece, and even that, that's kind of pointless. But that is an example of why you wouldn't, you wouldn't create an entire room to put in just a single ping pong ball. You'll want to create a room that can hold many ping pong balls. <laughs> 
and you have some way to identify each ping pong ball. I don't know, you write a number on it, ping pong ball, one, two, three, four. We're assigning it a surrogate key. Each ping pong ball gets a number. We can fill the room full of ping pong balls. So a customer entity such as this, we got a customer number, name, an address, contact name and email address. And then we have two instances. So each of these instances have a number, a customer name, a street, city, state, zip, and a contact name and email address. So the entity defines the thing. The instances are the values of said thing. So right now, when you're doing database design, the only purpose the instances serve is to make sure that your data structure is correct. You don't actually care about the instances themselves. What you care about is if you can fit that instance in your entity. And if you have an instance and you can get it into the entity, that means your entity is not defined correctly. So, is that kind of clear? Before I move on. So what we're going to be worrying about this week and next week is we're worrying about the box. We don't care about what we're putting in the box. We just want to make sure that whatever we're going to put in that box fits. So the box is not too small, not too big, the wrong shape. We want to make sure it's the right shape and size. In other words, it describes the entity properly so that any given piece of data fits. If I was defining a student's table, I'd have to make sure I have, you know, name, address, phone number, date of birth, anything else I need. If I suddenly go to put a student into the table and I discover I have a place to put in a phone number, my entity isn't defined right. Therefore, we got to make sure the entity fits the instance. Instances. You should never bet on just the first instance being the only instance. I've had students come here who only have one name. Whichever, there's a few countries around the world where people only have one name. There's some countries around the world where males have two names and females have one name. But it doesn't apply to the entire country either. It only applies to specific provinces in said country. Um, which is why I end up sometimes with students that have the same first name and last name because they don't have a last name, so they use their first name twice. It's entertaining, under learning why it is that way as a person who's never experienced it. So entities and tables. So the biggest difference between an entity and a table, because you know so far we've used them kind of interchangeably, is you can express a relationship between entities without using foreign keys. So if you're talking about tables, you actually have to create the foreign keys. You have to have the primary keys and they have to exist in both places when you're creating it. A relation or an entity, I mean, sorry, an entity, we can define it without having to worry about the primary keys. For example, ins instructor, student. You guys have an instructor. I have students. We're not defining any foreign keys. We just say there's a relationship between you and I. One to many in this case. That's it. So when we're doing the initial design, we don't care about what the physical linkage is. We just want to say there is a relationship. We know there's a connection. We're going to worry about it later. We're going to kick the can down the road, as they say. But for now, we're going to identify that there's a relationship and we are going to stop at that point. So it makes it easier to work with the entities during the design process, because during the initial process, you may not know exactly what the relations are between objects. You may not know uh, what all the attributes are, which we'll be talking about in a bit. You may not know, you might not know all the bits and pieces that define the entity. Therefore, why would you start creating physical representations of said thing if you don't know what it looks like? Um, anybody here ever play with, um, do any 3D modeling? 3D printers? Anybody? No? Wow, what a sad bunch of geeks. 
Uh, I'm just kidding. Actually, I think you're the first group I've ever asked that question where I didn't have at least one hand come up. Um, so when people are creating new products, they will design it on the computer multiple times and maybe print them out one at a time while they're trying to do the initial design. They won't refine it until it's just right because it's going through multiple steps. When you're designing database structures, it's the same idea. You're, you're going to iterate through some of the data and you may not know all the things you need. Therefore, you're not going to worry about physically defining relationships right away because they might change and they're just going to make yourself extra work. So there are, you know, another good example is when people that draw, that do digital drawing. Sometimes your first sketch looks nothing like what you ended up with because you're constantly making little revisions. So you start with a rough sketch, you refine your rough sketch, you realize you suck, you decide to do it again until it improves, until you're able to have a, a pretty good structure and then you finish it. It's the same idea. So back to our happy keys. An identifier is an attribute that distinguishes an instance from every other instance of the same um, entity. So when you guys are being added to a system, so let's, let's pretend we don't have a student information system yet. So we're going to say, okay, we need to be able to identify people. So we're going to want to try to come up with some candidate keys and we could th start throwing things out, right? Well, we're only going to have Canadian students, so we'll use a SIN number. Oh, we have international students. Okay, well, maybe we'll use passport numbers. Oh, uh, guess what? Not all Canadian citizens have a passport, so you can't use a passport number. So you start trying to guess what the candidate combination of the candidate keys might be, and eventually a combination of candidate keys will give you the identifier, which eventually may turn into a primary key. Okay, so attributes. So, so far we understand the concept of an entity, slash entity type, slash entity class and the difference between an entity and an instance, the attributes describe the entity. These will become columns in a physical table later. So when we're talking about the actual structure of the database physically at the end, it becomes the columns. They describe the different characteristics. Going back to the student, because at least that's something you all have in common. Attributes that define a student, first name, last name, government issued ID, date of birth. Those are attributes that describe each and every one of you. You will all have these attributes. Yeah, well, unless you live in your car, but yes, you could have an address. Hey, the van life, it's a thing. Not as much in Canada, but it's a big thing in the States. But Yes, address, email address is probably a little more accurate for that. Um, phone number, because probably most of you have a phone number of some sort tied to you. Those are attributes that describe a student, the student being an entity. So, and, it, and it basically any given instance must have must share all the same attributes at a minimum. You may have a few extra attributes that other members of the entity type have that don't have. But they might not be important to the entity, so therefore we wouldn't include those attributes. A good example, do you have kids? Is that important to describe a student? No. It might explain why you are the way you are, but it has nothing to do with a student per se. So that's an extra at, that's an extra attribute that doesn't need to be lo not logged, uh, defined. So back in the day, there was a few um, ways of describing um, attributes and uh, the entities. So there's these are two different conventions that do the exact same thing. So the one on the left right here 
This is the good old fashioned entity relationship diagram. So when we talk about ERDs, this is a conceptual ERD. <clears throat> the entity is a box. The attributes are bubbles off the box. Ellipses, not circles. Ovals, ellipses, if you want the technical term for an oval. A lot of modern design software has decided to go, we don't like making people do bubbles and boxes. And there's actually another one, it's a diamond. They go, we don't like that. So we're going to just do it like a table. So we got the entity name at the top. You got the identifier at the very top in its own section, then everything else under it. The employee number here in this dark blue section is the same thing as the underlined attribute in the ellipses. They're functionally equivalent to each other. One takes a lot less room on a piece of paper. And if you are writing database design software, you probably already have code to draw boxes with things in it instead of having to draw a sec add a second piece. All right. I'm skipping identifiers because we already talked about it ad nauseum. All right, so using the square box approach, we have the, there's three ways of displaying this. And in other words, three levels of detail. And depending which software you use, uh, they'll show, they'll give you the choice of how you want to display this. Uh, they'll either let you put in just as a box with like employee like this, or they'll do the one with just the identifier or the fully detailed one. Um, normally, this one is the most useful because it's actually described. You don't want to have under described. Now, this one here, on the other hand, is useful at a very high level. If I want to talk about a relationship between teachers and students, Maybe we don't want to have all the attributes listed. We just want to worry about the fact there's an entity called teacher and an entity called student, and that there's a relationship between that. Now, that leads me to um, relationships. So, not relations, relationships. Remember, has more letters. They serve two different jobs, uh, not just because it has more letters, it's just the way you can help remember that they're not the same thing. A relationship is an association amongst uh, two or more entities or entity classes or types. And an instance is the relationship between specific instances. So a relationship class would be the relationship between a professor and the students. So we know there's a relationship. It's a class of relationship. It's a kind of, it's a type of relationship. The instance would be the exact connection between myself and say you. That is an instance of a relationship, me to him, me to her. Those are instances. A class would be, in general, a prof to a student. So it could be you know, there could, there's probably, you know, 80 profs in ICT. I don't remember how many students we have, something like 10,000 over the, between everything running through the courses and the co-ops and everything. And there are relationship instances between each student and each prof, well, specific students and specific profs, I should say. And so that's the difference between an instance and a class. In other words, a type and a specific example. Again, you guys are a thing called a student, and each of you are instances of the student. There's a relationship between a prof and the students, but a specific connection between myself and one of you is an instance. A relationship can involve two or more entity classes. And again, this course is a perfect example. So there's a student. There's a prof, there's a course. The intersection of all three puts you in this room at this time. So 
that's what I mean by a relationship can involve two or more entity classes or entities. It's because sometimes you need more than two things to describe something properly. I mean, technically, if we really want to explore just how much um, is involved with having you guys in here, please let me have a oh, It's a red one. Okay. We have a student. We have prof. We have a course. We have a term. We have a section. We have a room. And these are all the things that make up the fact that you guys are sitting in this room right now. Actually, I think there's more than this, but basically put the course and the term define a section, but there could actually be more than that because this course alone has six sections. So we have a student, we've got a prof, we've got a section, we've got a room that all intersect into another thing, which we don't know what it is yet because we haven't modeled it yet. But just show you guys that, you know, sometimes to model something, you need to have more than one entity and they all end up feeding into something. It's a concept at least that should be somewhat familiar to you guys. I know it's only your second week in school, but after a few terms at the college, this will make so much more sense to you. But it is what it is. So there are degrees of relationships. And at first they tried to get really clever and they decided to give each kind of relationship a name. So a binary relationship is a relationship between two entities. Course to section is a binary relationship. Let's pretend this one's not here right now, okay? Course to relate section is a binary relationship because there's there's only one involved in this relationship. Then somebody says, well, you know, we'll have cases where three relationships are connected to each other, so we'll call it a ternary relationship. And then somebody chirped in and goes, well, what happens when we have four? The other guy said, shut up. They just stopped naming them after ternary. So they went, there's binary, which means there's two involved. There's a ternary where, you know, three is involved. And after that, they just stopped. They had quaternary, then we got five, six, seven, eight. I mean, technically this one has four, but realistically there's probably a time also. You know, there could be a couple of other things that feed into this that I'm not aware of here at the school. So they just stopped after three. So there's binary, ternary, and everything else. But these are terms you'll see. So a relationship between two things, and only it only affects those two things, is a binary relationship. So course to section is a binary relationship. However, section to student to prof to room is, well, it's something. In this case, it'd be a quaternary relationship, but because there's four, we can actually identify four. Um, but essentially, that's what the difference is. So going back to our good old boxes and diamonds, employee to a skill is a binary relationship. So the company I work for, we got bought out last summer. And one of the things we've had to do, because I don't big corporations really like doing this, is pegging people in certain holes. They really enjoy figuring out where you belong in an organization. So we all had to actually do surveys of our skill sets. How do you describe 26 years of industry experience into a survey? It's like pick out your skills and like half my skills weren't even on the list. Okay, fantastic. But it's an example of a binary relationship. Each employee is related to a skill. Each skill is related to an employee and there is no third party being involved in that. On the other hand, a ternary relationship would be there is a project being done 
there's a client, and then there's, say, an architect or an engineer or whatever also involved. So that means there's three entities participating in that relationship. That's the ternary. So if you were going to diagram it, it looks like this. So I don't know why the slides words it like this, but essentially there are three constraints and we didn't define them yet because I'm about to. So when we talk about, so far what we've talked about is in a way we've did talk about these, but well, I'm going to start with the second one, entity integrity. So an entity integrity means that it's entity, each instance fits into that box. In other words, to be able to define the entity instance, it must have all the appropriate pieces. If it doesn't have it, it doesn't have integrity. Therefore, we're worrying about the constraints that define that thing. The main integrity means you only feed certain values into specific boxes. So again, you wouldn't put a person's date of birth in their email field. You wouldn't put their email in their phone number. That is domain integrity. In other words, when you put data in, the data goes into the appropriate place. And it, that spot will only ever contain that specific data. And referential integrity means that the connection between two entities via the relationships are, um, <coughs> excuse me, enforced. In other words, uh, if you are defined to attend 8215, section 310, 23 fall, in T, whatever room this is, 119, that data is a relationship, it's referential integrity. You cannot be assigned to room T4550 because there's no room T4550. That is referential integrity. You cannot be assigned to something that does not exist. It cannot be, you cannot connect things that do not exist to each other. So the purpose of the three constraints, so the purpose of all three of these things is to create database integrity, which means once you've created entities and defined their attributes and defined their relationships and the integrity constraints, in other words, the rules put in place by your design enforce said structure, it'll create something called database integrity, which means that the data in our database is useful. The whole point of what you're going to be learning for the first half of this term is to make sure you can make a structure that is actually usable and useful and meaningful. You could, in theory, just throw everything into a bin and try to muck your way through it, but it's not useful, it's not meaningful, it doesn't serve a purpose. So, you hit the first point, domain integrity constraint. So it's the requirement that all the values in a column are the same kind. That's known as domain integrity constraint. Domain means it's a grouping of data that meets a specific definition. And domain, I'll be honest, the term domain is not something I use day to day in my job. It's, you know, a theory concept where when we're defining an entity and we're going to define its attributes, we're saying, the rules for this attribute is X. Therefore, X is the domain. So you say, oh, what's the domain for, for first name? Well, that means there's going to be a person's first name. It could be Bob, it could be Frank, it could be Dan, it could be Julia, you know, Antoinette, take your pick, insert name here. Therefore, all values of first name must come from names in that domain. In other words, you can't put in a date of birth in somebody's first name. Yeah, technically the database server may allow it, but the point is, is that that's not what's supposed to go in there. So the application is going to be defined in such a way that, you know, it shouldn't do that. Now, columns in different relations or attributes in different entities may have the same name. That's cool. That has nothing to do with the data that's contained in it. You can repeat the same name. For example, 
I'm sure that the employee records here have a first name, middle name, and last name. The student records probably have a first name, middle name, and last name. They have the columns may have the attributes may have the same name. Technically, the domains are very similar, but in any case, the student first name domain would be the first name of students. The employee first name domain would be the first name of the employees. Very similar data, but you wouldn't put a student's first name into the employee's first name unless they happen to also be an employee. But that's, you know, not a very common case. It happens, but it's not a very common case. Entity integrity means you're following. The primary key must have unique data values. So in other words, the primary key can never be duplicated. It cannot be null. It also means that um, that's essentially the biggest point of the integrity constraint that every row or every instance has a value for its primary key. It cannot be null. It must exist. It must be unique. And referential integrity constraint means it's a limit of what can go into uh, a foreign key. For example, we have a student number. We can't put a student number in this thing here unless there's a student that already exists. We can't assign a student to a specific room unless this room exists. That is referential integrity. You cannot create data in a foreign key, unless it already exists. In other words, it cannot register you as a student unless you exist. That's literally all it is, right? I mean, if you get asked for a passport number and you don't have a passport, you can't provide a passport number because you don't have that value. Therefore, you cannot add that value into a foreign key because it does not exist. Okay, so believe it or not, we're almost done. I'm, I'm sure people's brains are starting to leak. Um, week two is a terminology dump. There's a lot of theory, and I'll be giving you guys some reading assignments to help round round it out with appropriate page numbers from both editions of the textbook. <clears throat> Okay, so one of the next terms we're going to see is something called cardinality. And cardinality means the count, and it's expressed as a number, usually, right? You count stuff, it's usually numbers. Um, so maximum cardinality is the maximum number of relationship instances an entity can participate. In other words, the maximum number is how many copies of an instance can be tied to it. The minimum cardinality is the minimum number of relationships which must participate. Now, this sounds almost like they're, op they're almost the exact same thing. They're not quite the same thing. Okay, um, let's go with this. A minimum cardinality is either zero or one. In other words, it's optional or it must be there. That's zero or one. Maximum cardinality is one or more. It's not one, three, or five. It's one or more. So a one-to-many relationship is an example of an entity on one side has is a parent and the other one's a child. And each parent record can have zero, one, or more children. That is the, the one or more is the maximum cardinality. The zero or one is the minimum cardinality. In other words, I know it feels weird using the phrase parent without any child record tied to it, but in theory, you can have a record that exists that could have child records. Therefore, because it might have child records, and a good example of this is a student record. You just registered. You have not been assigned to any courses yet, but in theory, you could be assigned to many courses. Therefore, you and this relationship would be, parent would be 
the student. Assigned courses would be the child. The student can exist without any assigned courses. So therefore, the student can have zero, one, or more assigned courses. The zero or one is the minimum cardinality. In other words, it may or may not have a course. The one or more, so one of the word ones used twice here, means they can have one or more courses assigned. They might be coming to school for one course. They might be coming to school for multiple courses. So a parent can have many child, child records. However, each child can never have one parent record. That's a pretty straightforward concept. In other words, every child record cannot exist unless there is a matching parent record. And they can only ever belong to one parent record, let's say. So a good example would be an employee has one or more computers, but each computer is ever only ever assigned to one employee. So in this room, how many of you have at least one computer? How many of you have more than one computer? Okay. So here's a good example of one or more computers, but each of those computers only belong to you, right? So I've got four computers, I think. One of them is a closet, but it counts. So I have one or more computers, but each of those computers only belong to me. So the child, the computers, the child record, I'm the parent record because I own four of them. So maximum cardinality is the maximum number of participants that can participate in that. So we have three kinds of maximum cardinality, one to one. So this is a rarity. Rarely would you ever create anything that's only one to one. But you have two entities. There's only ever one connection between the two of them. One to many. One to many means that it's the example of the computers. One to, you know, one or more. Many to many. A good example of that is student to prof. As a prof, I have many students and you guys have many professors. How is it connected? Back to my little unnamed box here. However, that is the example of a many-to-many -many relationship. I have many students. I have two different course sections. Grand total, I think I have like 220 students this term. You guys have uh, probably six profs, seven or eight, depending on how the labs work out. So, well, if you have six courses now, and I know for a fact in this course, you have at least one more prof because of the labs. So at a minimum, you all have at least seven profs, unless you have exemptions. Many to many. So when we draw this on our diagram, we have something that looks like this. So we have a table called badges. We have a, something called employee, one to one. An employee gets to have one badge. Each badge belongs to one employee. I have one badge and only one badge at the college. And that badge belongs to me and only me. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the badge and myself. A one-to-many relationship, we're back to the person and computers, right? An employee can have multiple computers, but each computer can belong to one employee. And the many-to-many, Employee to skill, skill to employees. You could have multiple people with the same skills and the same skill could belong to multiple employees. Or to use the other example, many students, many profs. Okay. Yeah, I didn't hear the sigh of relief at all coming from the group. So yes, this was a big terminology dump and I completely realize it. And lectures one and two are terrible because of it. And I will completely admit it up front. Uh, it's good we ended in an hour and a half. You get to go home and relax. Uh, drink some terrible coffee. Um, so I will post up the appropriate reading with the right chapter numbers. Like I posted last week for 
chapters for it's the fifth, uh, the sixteenth edition. I actually do know what the page numbers are for the fifteenth edition. So I'll post last week's page readings and this week's readings also. Um, the chapters really do round out what I was talking about because they have more examples and stuff. Outside of that, uh, Lab 1 should be due at the end of this week. Lab 2 was released yesterday. Um, make sure to communicate with your lab profs is all I've got to say. Outside of that, guys, enjoy your evening. Have a good one.